Thank you, Jen, for introductions. And Mr. Rini, you have given a very uh, amazing talks, and it overlaps with my with my talks, and it helps a lot uh, later on when I try to explain certain uh, points. So I always start with this uh, table uh, whenever I give a talk on epilepsy, epilepsy management to a general population. Uh, general physicians and even medical students or in those doctors in primary care uh, medicines, partly because uh, there is a trend of shifting the care of medicines from medicines for, from primary care to uh, neurology. In the past, when I was a houseman, uh, when I was asked to go and see uh, patients or help up in a very busy uh, clinic, I have even a chance to see epilepsy patients, but now houseman has no more opportunity to see patient in the clinic. Then later on, the MO will be in charge taking care of epilepsy patient and subsequently the physicians. And then later on, the neurologist. And now there is even a, a certain subspecialty called epileptologists who are specialized in epilepsy care. So when we ask about, you know, ask my friend uh, in the uh, in GP, in a general clinic, many of them has not have any uh, experience or much experience on taking care of seizure and epilepsy, which I think we need to shift on uh, lay in the in the plan uh, for uh, epilepsy management. So this is the one that I suggested to my primary care team. You know, try try your best to start off with making a diagnosis, understanding them in terms of semiology, as what uh, Dr. Ku has mentioned. Uh, determine whether they are seizure or not, as what Prof. Raymond uh, stated, and then go on to the investigations as necessary uh, by Prof. another <laughs> Dr. Raymond Tan, and then only talking about management and perhaps start the initial management before refer to uh, the neurology team. This is the consensus guideline, and there is a, a participant asking about where it is. This is in www.neuro.org.my and then you click on the resources and then you click on the consensus guideline and you will see the uh, guidelines and it's downloadable in PDF uh, format. Uh, as I usually started uh, uh, management or talks on seizures going through this list, but today I'm not going to talk about this, partly because it was covered previously and I'm only going to uh, em emphasize or focus on this uh, map of principle of management. However, I'll only talk mostly on first seizures and second, uh, choosing the correct first line uh, antiepileptic drugs rather than going on to the others, partly because this is for general pool. So let's start uh, with the first case. Huh? So this is a, a patient, 30 years old man with first uh, generalized tonic heart seizure, no, def no focal deficits and clinical examination, scan normal, uh, biochemistry, blood screening or normal, EG normal. Do you want to start, uh, AD? Can I have the pool for case number one? Mm. Yes. So do you want to start AD? Wait, no. Wait first or start immediately. Okay, can I have the pool results? Can, can I have the pool results? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, many people will say wait, and 5% uh, will say uh, start trade, uh, straight away. So in fact, this is what I usually do as well. I'll talk to the patient, give them the, both the options and uh, let them choose, but most of them will choose to wait. Uh, so what will happen is that for first seizure, half will have recur will not have recurrence. And that's why if you start treatment for two years and patient may not have recurrence, which means that patient have to take two years medication for no reasons. And secondly, the immediate treatment will not improve long-term remission rate. So even you start later on, uh, the overall outcome and quality of life are still the same. So, but however, there are certain conditions that we will consider starting treatment even when the first when patient have first seizures, especially if there is a scan lesion in the CT brain, if there is abnormal EEG, especially the one show uh, by 
the, the Raymond Tan uh, with uh, generalized poly spike and wave and so on. If there's positive family history, if there are a lot of night seizures, uh, nocturnal sleep seizures, partly because patients cannot be uh, or unsure about how many seizures they have in the past. They may thought this is the first one, but in fact, they have many more in the past. Or, or lastly, if the patient have cognitive impairment, then you know that there is already a brain damage which can predispose to seizure. Uh, then it's still a stronger reasons to consider starting uh, medication more. So based on the definition in 2014, there is a very key uh, statement here, which is 60% recurrence risk, which means that any of the patient, if you think that their chance of developing another seizures is 60% or higher, then you would want to start treatment. But what is 60% and how do we determine 60%? Based on this chart on the left, uh, uh, Y axis, you will see that all the numbers here are percentage. So 0.4 means 40%, 0 0.6 means 60%. So if we draw a line of one year across, the only one that is likely to have 60% chance of having seizures is those with remote symptomatic uh, causes. What does it mean? It means that if someone having an abnormal scan, uh, for example, having an old stroke or having an old trauma or having an old brain injury or tumor, then the chance of them having another seizures will be 60% or higher. And therefore, in this case, you would want to start treatment. However, if someone having two seizures, then you would consider high, higher chance of uh, recurrence as high as 60%. As you can see on the graph over the left here, the lower line is the percentage of recurrence patient in first seizures. Even up to three, uh, three years here and six years, the chance of them having another seizure is only about 40% for those with only one seizure. But if they have two seizures, the likelihood of having another seizure in one year go up to 60%. So the second rule is if their seizure recurred or if they have two or more seizures, then you would start treatments. The third rule is this. This chart is a bit uh, interesting. If you read, this is the chance of having seizure recurrence after the first seizures. So after one year, there are 30% of them will have recurrent seizures. However, from one year all the way up to five years, this difference tell us how likely is the chance of having a seizure if someone have no seizure for two years. All right, so after two years, until five years, there is only about 10% chance of having a seizure. What, what it means is that if someone has no seizure for one or two years, the likelihood of them having another seizures or seizure recurrence is only about 10%. So the risk is very slow, very low. Therefore, come back to the, to the first uh, seizures conclusion is that whenever you have an abnormal scan, abnormal EEG, positive family history, after second seizure, night seizure, or if cognitive impairment, then only you will start uh, uh, seizure medications. This is the guideline by AAN, American uh, Association, Academy of Neurology. There are only two key points here. The first point, Starting treatment for first seizures, it will reduce seizure recurrence risk. However, starting treatment for first seizures will not improve quality of life. So if we explain this to the, to the patients, most patients will prefer not to start treatment unless some patients are very concerned they have severe injury in the first seizures, they have status epilepticus, or they, some of them uh, dislocate their shoulders after the first seizures then they will consider higher, uh, uh, more highly than the other patients to start uh, antiepileptic drugs after, even after their first seizures and even uh, their scan and EEGs are normal. Second rule is how to choose the first ADs. There are a few principles. The first principle is that we want to achieve seizure control but with minimal side effect. So this is a key terms. Effective, but not 
are much side effect, tolerable, effective, efficacy and tolerability. So what are the side effects that, or what are the key factors that we consider in this guideline? This is in fact a very old guideline, but very useful because it looks at various factors. And I'll go through some of them one by one. And you can see that it's even cover insurance coverage for expensive medication and so on. Uh, so we, we shall go through this uh, later on using various cases so that we will understand this better. Okay, so using this guideline, we want monotherapy. Why monotherapy? Because monotherapy, firstly, it has less side effect. Combination of therapy medications will increase the chance of having a side effect. Second, it's simpler, it improves compliance. Patients is easier to uh, remember. There's less or no potential drug drug interactions and it's actually cheaper. So first rule is monotherapy. And which drugs to choose? I have four created four rules for you. The first rule is follow the evidence. This is the evidence comparing medications among various groups. And just look at the few uh, examples here. Huh? First one, partial onset seizures, which we call focal seizure now. Focal seizure in adult, class one, carbamazepine, levitiracetam, clinitoin, zonisamide. Okay. Second, elderly, class one, there are a few class two and three as well, is gabapentin and lamotrigine. Lamotrigine is in fact a medication with very few side effects. But interestingly, gabapentin has become uh, one of the flavor A treatments for elderly as well. Third, Epson seizures in children. The flavor A evidence is etosacemide and sodium valproate. We don't have etosacemide in Malaysia. It needs a special import. Uh, permit which is we have intended to do, do that for one patient. Otherwise, the treatment we use nowadays mainly is sodium valproate and it is in children. So don't worry about childbearing, don't worry about teratogenicity, and don't worry about pregnancy. However, for juvenile mild chronic epilepsy, we have only two uh, level D uh, evidence, which is topiramate and sodium valproate. So if you don't use Walprate, you may consider topiramids, but topiramids also have teratogenicity risk. So we go to the next one, which is lamotrigine and levy deracetam. So this is the rule number one, get the evidence and follow the evidence. Rule number two, follow the seizure types. Just focus on those with yellow bar. Yellow bar cover a lot of others generalized uh, seizures types mainly myoclonic seizures and epson seizures. This is generalized tonic-clonic seizure, GTCS. CPS is complex partial seizure, or what we call as focal seizure with impaired awareness, FIAS. SPS is simple partial seizures. In the past, we call uh, focal seizure with uh, focal aware seizures. So what are the medications which is useful for generalized seizure types? Firstly, sodium valproate yellow bar, it cover, it is suitable for all types, so then we'll pray. Lamotrigine is supposed to be suitable for all as well, but in some with mild chronic seizures, it may aggravate up to 30%. The others are the newer medication, including topiramate, sonisamide, as well as levitiracetam. So this becomes some of the options when you are treating especially generalized seizures. Third, follow the guideline. This is Malaysian Consensus Guideline, as I mentioned, you can download from our Neurology uh, MSN web website. Uh, in this guideline, you can see that for focal seizure, these are the monotherapy that we have recommended. Let me go through the list again. Carbamazepine, Lamotrigine, Levitiracetam, Ocarbazepine, which is trileptal, <laughs> Sodium Valproate, and Sonisamide. For myoclonic seizures, is still sodium valproate followed by levitiracetam and topiramates. You see that lamotrigine is not listed here, partly because, as I mentioned, it has 30% uh, seizure aggravations, but yet it is still effective 
in the others 50 to 60 percent. So this can still be considered, but not in the list. And the last is the last rule is keep it simple. If you can't remember any of the number, uh, the names above, then just remember generalized epilepsy, so then malprate. But if not, then we try consider lamotrigine or levetiracetam. Focal epilepsy, we consider carbamazepine. But if carbamazepine is not working or you have concern or HLA B positive, then you can use lamotrigine, levetiracetam, and zonisamides. These are some of the recommendations and we will go through the reasons why uh, based on cases uh, later on. Okay, so can I have the pool now? So this is for a 16 years old boy with generalized seizures. Remember, this is a boy. Huh? Given phenytoin and developed early morning mild chronic jerks, EEG show generalized uh, polyspite and wave complexes. So what diagnosis is this, this patient has? Juvenile, huh? firstly, the onset is juvenile age. Secondly, get myoclonic seizures with polyspine wave. So the diagnosis is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So which AD would you consider? Walprate, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, levetiracetam. Based on the four rules just now, huh? the evidence, the seizure types, the... Uh, oh, okay. Wow, so fast. So the... And the guidelines as well as the simple rules. So based on the simple rules, while well, prick is good, and this is a boy, we have no other cons, uh, concern, and we can straight away say, oh, while well, prick is the best. Jonah malchronic epilepsy is a syndrome, uh, which is a generalized epilepsy syndrome. Seizure is easily controlled. However, a lot of them has recurrence. So do we want to start treatment? Yes. For boy, it's sodium while prick. For female, we have to consider others. And don't use carbamazepine and phenytoin because they can aggravate now chronic seizures. And remember, as I mentioned just now, amotrigine was not listed in the guidelines because it has also 30% chance of aggravations but can be used. When we talk about how long do we start treatments or continue the treatment, even if the seizure is controlled, usually I told the patient in a more positive way. I said that maybe after two years, if you have no seizure, uh, you can consider cutting down if you are not facing a severe stress like exam or uh, job uh, requirement. However, the chance of recurrence is high, at, as high as 70%. So some patients, or in fact, most of my patients with JME, they are on treatments lifelong because they will have on and off seizures when they cut down their dose, when they have uh, late sleep, when they have exam, when they have a lot of works and stress or miss their dose, they will have recurrence of seizures. How about girls? So this is ABCDE and I didn't create a pool for this. But the key thing is we want to avoid wild prey as uh, uh, Surimi has mentioned. So because of that, I won't go through the details, but I'll just quickly discuss how about the others. So this one also Surimi has already stated and it is a follow-up study up to six years old uh, about the low uh, IQ. But remember, this is dose dependent. Teratogenicity, I just want to mention about carbamazepine. Now, carbamazepine is in between. Over here is about 3%. This is the North American guideline. And this one, the risk is about 2.3%. Just remember, as Serene mentioned, 2 to 2.5% malformation risk is present in general population. Anyone, any women, any pregnant women without any diseases, the chance is 2.5%. In Malaysia, why we still use carbamazepine despite a D uh, recommendation is because in Malaysia, our carbamazepine dose that we use are usually very small. We use 100 mg BD, 200 mg BD, as high as 400 mg a day. We seldom go to 600, 800, or even 1000. Partly because Malaysian, they don't tolerate carbamazepine that well. So as compared to Caucasians, they use as high as 1000, 1200, or 1400 milligram a day. Whereas in Malaysia, in Asian, we don't use that high. And therefore, in certain population, the delatogenicity risk 
for carbon mazepine is in fact not as high as sodium vapor and phenytoin. And because of that, this is still one of the options we use even in a pregnant lady. But we may need to monitor their drug level. So the yellow one, I just want to highlight topiramids. Topiramids, in the, in the, in, when it first uh, came out, there isn't much information. But later on, we found out that even in our patients, patients uh, the baby developed cleft palate, there are many mouth, other mouth formations. And now we also try to avoid uh, topiramids in a uh, pregnant mother. So just remember, among all the newer medication, topiramids is the one that we want to avoid. So this chart, uh, Serini also has mentioned, and I just want to talk about the, uh, the dose dependency. Higher the dose, higher the risk of teratogenicity. So therefore, if someone who is only on small dose of medications, then we have a few options if they want to get uh, pregnant. First, if they have seizure, they have been seizure free for two years, even in JME, and wanted to get pregnant, I would still consider a trial of withdrawal, either cutting down or stop the medication. Partly because they has been seizure free for two years, and we can consider whether is the is they can maintain the seizure freedom despite uh, not on any medication. Second, if the dose is high, then we should consider other uh, AEDs prior to the pregnancy. If it's already pregnant, then nothing much can be done. Huh? Thirdly, if the, dose, if the dose is very small, like for on epilim of 200 BD, which is only 400 milligram a day, you can see that the risk of the, red, the teratogenicity risk of 400 milligram a day is as uh, similar or uh, to the higher dose of lamotrigine. So it doesn't really affect much. Third, thirdly, also because of the duration of pregnancy, if someone already getting pregnant and in the first trimester, the risk of malformations is already there and is over. So there is no point changing the uh, medications when they are already in their end of first, pregnant, first trimester or going to the second trimester. So this one, uh, Serini has covered, I will skip this just to remember that although there is a notice by NPRA, which is National Pharmaceutical Regulation Agency, we will still use sodium valproate in female according to individual preference and cases. Okay, so in a girl, valproate is the first line. Sometimes it's much useful as I have a patient which I switched to lamotrigine. Oh, sorry, it's not the pool yet. <laughs> not the pool yet. Not the pool yet. So thank you. Mm. So while pre, uh, I have a patient who has frequent injury after I switched to lamotrigine, then Capra, and Capra she developed irritability and the myoclonic jerk is just not controlled. She will come back with bruises on the face, bruises on the leg because she has injury and. I have no choice but to switch it back to sodium malprate and it works and patient is well. Another option which I want to try is sonisamide or topiramids. That one also cause uh, side effect in that patient. Okay, so carbamazepine and fintoin can aggravate my chronic jerks don't use and protegene may aggravate my chronic jerks as well. And the problem of using lamotrigine in pregnancy is because of the interactions with the hormones and in pregnancy. Every tiracetam is in fact a good choice. Uh, in the past, it's very expensive, but now we have generic drugs and it's, using, uh, it's being used more and more, even in government hospital up to district uh, level. But I realized that every tiracetam is not present in many uh, primary care or KK or clinical steatan, or they have uh, specific quota. So not everyone can be given uh, every tiracetam. Lamotrigine uh, level has been mentioned, so I will not go through the details, just to mention that lamotrigine level can be checked in private lab. So in government hospitals, don't offer lamotrigine level uh, TDM, but can be checked in private lab. 
uh, it costs about 200 ringgit here. Just remember, check them in first, sorry, in second trimester and third trimester if uh, you want to make sure the control or the level is uh, therapeutics. Women's, uh, the one that in addition is polycystic ovarian syndrome, we just need to make sure it's very common in normal population, but it's higher in those with, with sodium valproate. And if you can, try to avoid sodium valproate, especially in obese uh, lady. Okay, so now we come to the third uh, question, which we need to pull here. Huh? This is focal epilepsy. As I covered, first seizure, generalized seizures, and now we come to focal seizures. So this is the third part. Okay, so based on Dr. Ku, uh, semiology, uh, lecture. Patient has oral automatism and left dystonia. Where is the seizure from? Okay, answer is temporal lobe. And where is it? Is it left or right? Answer is right side because the patient has left dystonia. Okay, this is a repeat of what Ku uh, has mentioned just now. So the pool. Can we have the pool now or cannot? <laughs> so, okay, great. So which one do you consider? There are so many of them. Huh? Which one? Or some of them, if you don't know what it is, then you don't have to take. Hmm. Which AD would you consider based on the simple rules, evidence, uh, guideline, seizure type, and simple rules? Okay. <laughs> okay, can we have the answer now? Oh, wow, 67% follow the rules. All right, let's go to some of the other drugs. Huh? In fact, all of them can be used, but carbamazepine is the first one we consider. The others, the parenpanil and necostamides, they are, in fact, the newer medications, okay? So this is a guideline, carbamazepine and phenytoin, but we don't use phenytoin nowadays because of a lot of side effects, unless in a very refractory patients, or I, some people ask me, if I start IV phenytoin for status epilepticus, what should I use next? Usually in the past, I will continue phenytoin, change IV to oral. But nowadays, I will switch to carbamazepine if I have checked their HLA B1502 level. Okay, so what happened is someone admitted status, given IV phenytoin, I'll continue with oral phenytoin, but switch to carbamazepine later. As we know that not everyone uh, responds to medication, especially for girl seizures. The response rate is only about 60% and 40% will not respond and we need many other newer medications and therefore we need to know them. So in this case, uh, a lot of them are, are preferred carbamazepine. In fact, in our cohort, we use carbamazepine as well. But the seizure freedom rate, if we expect, is about 40 to 50% as it is. In fact, there are half of them will not be seizure free. So because of that, we want to consider other agents and we need to know that. But prior to carbamazepine, in the old days, without HLA 1502, I'll just say this. I'm going to start this carbamazepine. There is a chance in one in 1,000 or 0.1% that you may develop uh, skin reactions or allergic reactions. If you have rash, if you have blister, you have uh, mouth ulcer, you stop the medication immediately. This is what I'll do in the past. Or in some center without the HLA screening, we also can do that. But now we have a screening, which is HLA B1502, which was uh, reported in Taiwan. And Taiwan uh, realized that the chance of having uh, Stephen Johnson with HLA B1502 is much higher. We in fact replicate this in among our Asian group, this is in Thai, in Indians, Malaysian Indians, in Vietnam, in Malaysia, and then in the Indonesia, in Myanmar. You can see that we have done a lot on the, on the carbamazepine HLA work uh, among the Asians. And in fact, population having HLA B1502 uh, belongs to the South China and South Asian groups including Taiwan, South China, Thai, Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, Malaysia. 
and Singapore of course. Uh, not in the North China, not much in, in not much in India, and don't uh, worry in Japan and Caucasians. Uh. So, however, not everyone with positive HLA B1502 will have Steven Johnson. The risk is about one in 20. So let's say someone is tested positive. There is 5% chance of them develop Steven Johnson, but it's high. Partly because if someone develops Steven Johnson, it can be very severe, it can affect their eyes, it can even affect their skins with long-term sequelae. All right, so it is very high. So tested positive, we would not give a, a, a carbamazepine. Tested negative, the risk is small and therefore we can still give, but yet there is still a small, very, very small risk. Even someone with tested negative for 1502, they can still develop Steven Johnson. In our cohort, one third, huh, about two out of eight, sorry, one quarter, 25% of all people, of all patients with Steven Johnson secondary to carbamazepine, huh, 25%, doesn't have 1502. So it can still happen. Just remind the patients to stop whenever they develop the rash. So if they fail to re respond to carbamazepine, what is next? We can consider all the newer medication. But this chart told you that none of them are really much, much better than carbamazepine. Okay, so on the left chart is 50% seizure reduction. On the right chart is seizure freedom. And they are all compared to carbamazepine. This is the enzyme-inducing enzyme group in the upper half and the non-enzyme-inducing group in the lower half. It just say that they are just slightly or similar in terms of efficacy to carbamazepine. However, if the seizure is very frequent, very severe, I will consider topiramids first, partly because it is very effective. However, topiramids has a lot of side effects. Patient cannot tolerate, patient have word finding difficulties. If the patient is milder, having less frequent seizure, like once a month or once every two months, then we can consider lamotrigine and sonicamide, which is less effective, but also uh, less side effect. Tolerability is better. In the past, uh, we don't use levetiracetam that often because of the cost. But now if you are using generic, then this can be one of the good choice uh, in treating focal epilepsy, not responding or not suitable for carbamazepine. Drug drug interaction, we talked about oral contraceptions just now, there is an interaction. So we should avoid all the enzyme inducers, especially carbamazepine. The oral, if someone is on oral contraceptions, they may also affect the lamotrigine level and the lamotrigine level being dropped because of the estrogen as well. How about COVID treatment? Huh? We are now having COVID treatments. It, there is in fact drug drug interactions between COVID treatments, especially chloroquines and all the antiviral with the enzyme inducers like carbamazepine. So if an epilepsy patient develop COVID, then we should consider uh, whether to switch their anti epileptic drugs or to, to levy tiracetam or topiramids or uh, consider uh, drug drug interactions during the treatments. In elderly, we try to uh, look into one of the important side effects, which is osteoporosis, especially the enzyme-inducing drugs. And therefore, in elderly, we should consider doing bone uh, mineral density as well as uh, supplement them with vitamin D if possible. So these are the newer anti-epileptic drugs in the past, we have only old generation and new generation, but now we have first, second, and third generation. Third generations are those come in in the last 10 years, including parenpanil and lacosamide. But lacosamide is not uh, distributed in Malaysia anymore because we don't have a, a distributing company. However, we still can import, like my, my hospital, we still have an individual import perm permit for those on lacosamide. Why are new medications considered? They are not much better in efficacy. It's about the same. They are not much better in side effects. Some are better, some are poorer. Like parent panel can have uh, uh, 
severe drowsiness and sleepiness, but if you are giving them during sleep or before sleep, then this side effect can be manageable. However, what we are trying to do is we are trying to find medications with new mechanism of actions or new tolerability so that it can help the patients who are refractory to the older medications. So we can keep trying. And this is a very long chart just to, man, just to highlight that the newer medications, a lot of them has different uh, mechanism of actions or modified in their mechanism of actions. So I summarize all again. Uh, today I cover about first seizures and choosing first line and diabetic drugs, especially on the principles. And I only introduce you on some new, newer ADs so that if the patient is not responsive to medications, refer to us to try some new uh, medications. And if it's not, cure, not responsive to drugs, we should consider surgery later on, which Sugandi will talk about it. So this is a chart again. Think about it. If you are in the general medicine, if you are in the primary care, if you are in the clinical seatan or GP or medical students, uh, don't refer to neurology straight away. Huh? Consider doing the diagnosis, get the investigations, start the initial management, and then consult. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof Lim, for your uh, lecture. Um, I think um, it was very, very comprehensive. You touched on the types of uh, suitable treatment for focal generalized epilepsy. Uh, you talked a bit on the um, treatment for older uh, patients and women. And um, we've got a few questions yes, in the I saw chat that. group. You want, to, you, want yeah. me, you want me to answer? Oh, yeah, okay. if you, First we can, one, maybe 10 years we can old have. Girl. <laughs> yeah. 10 years old girl with absence seizures, huh? I mean, most likely childhood absence. Their absence may go away, um, it may go into remissions when they grow older, before they get married, before they get pregnant. So uh, I will still use Walpret, but if they, they have other side effects like you know, obesity and so on, we can still uh, manage them accordingly. Epilim or sodium Walpret related. Uh, obesity, I don't straight away stop sodium operate. I will ask them to exercise, control their diets, have a healthy lifestyle first and see whether it helps or not. Itosacemide is not available in Malaysia. If you need that, we need a special import permit. The case I mentioned just now is a young man, 15 years old, having juvenile epson status. His epson seizure is every 10 uh, minutes, there will be one seizure but he, he will not uh, uh, be aware. Some of the seizures we record in the EG, he will just blank stare for a while and then he will, he will be okay. And he can continue studying, but no drugs, none. No available drugs in Malaysia can control that seizures. And that's why we import etosacemide. But at the end, uh, he somehow, uh, you know, somehow his seizure was controlled with, before the etosacemide was uh, imported. Second question from Adrian, JME and focal epilepsy, do we wait for second occurrence of seizures as in the first unprovoked seizures? Answer is yes. A lot of times, JME, if the EEG is normal and scan uh, is also normal, you are unsure because JME, most often the EEG will be abnormal. All right, so myoclonic seizures, abnormal EEG, I will start straight away. Uh, myoclonic seizures with family history, I will start medication straight away. But if there is just mild chronic seizure alone without other factors, we may still wait, partly because it's only a few jerks in the morning. They have no general tonic chronic seizures yet. So we can discuss with the, with the patients as Sereni mentioned, counsel, talk, and then we uh, will wait and see. Moshida Ainun uh, asks, if we need to change AAD, is there any dose equivalence we have to start with lower Lowest dose answer is yes. There is very difficult to find equivalent dose except carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. We can use those to dose uh, exchange. Otherwise, lamotrigine to levetiracetam or carbamazepine to levetiracetam. 
we will never know what is the equivalent dose. So we always start with the lowest dose and titrate. So the rules is keep the first one, push the second one up until good maintenance dose, then only cut down the first one. This is what I usually do. If you look at the video I'm showing now, keep the first one, push up the second one, then only cut down the first one. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hanid, it provokes seizures due to inter infections or any other brain insults, would you continue AEDs? Answer is, if you think the insults is going to be continuous, like an encephalitis with persistent or permanent brain damage, then we will need to continue anti-epileptic drugs. But if it's just a meningitis, which has recovered and there is no uh, brain damage, then the chance of recurrence is actually low and you think that insult is over, then you may want to wait. So another example, a severe brain injury with intracranial bleed. It will cause scarring and hemostyrene uh, uh, depositions in the brain, likely to have recurrent seizures, and therefore we continue. Alvin, Olivia, thank you. Just a simple question. We decided to start AD in patient first seizures. How long do we keep the patients on AD? Because consider the rules is two years, as I usually talk to my patients, seizure-free for two years. Then after that, we can consider reducing or stopping the medications. What is the protocol of stopping AD in post-stroke uh, epilepsy? Answer is that I usually don't uh, stop, although we still follow the two years seizure remission rules. Partly because, okay, stroke, if it's small, like lacuna stroke, then the chance of recurrence or even causing a seizure is lower. Sometimes we are happy or feel safer to stop after no seizures for two years. But if it's a very big stroke, a cortical stroke by like MCA stroke, then we wouldn't uh, want to stop the AEDs because the chance of recurrence is high. Thank you very much. Yes.